Hello there, I'm Carl Conley, Chief Technologist with Ingram Micro's Catalyst Business Unit. Today's conversation is all about 5G. And over the last two years, I've been talking to a lot of our partners and it's rather apparent that there's still a lot of confusion or ambiguity as to how managed service providers can actually play in the 5G market and monetize it. And therefore, over the course of today's presentation, what I hope to do is lay the foundation again for you about what 5G is. We'll talk about the spectrum. We'll talk about the attributes. We'll talk about where we are in the release of 5G. And then we'll talk a little bit about the architecture before diving into some of the use cases and then specifically around some of the solutions that Ingram Micro has that are available to our partners today. So let's start with the very basics. 5G, what is it? Well, it's the fifth generation of cellular technology. And 5G, like all the other Gs, are governed by a body called the 3GPP. And they dictate what features and functionalities go into each release. And we're currently at release 16. Release 17 should be out this year. But in release 16, uh, irrespective, uh, 5G should adhere to the three major attributes or groupings of fun features and functions. And those are, it should support enhanced mobile broadband, ultra-reliable low-latency communications, and massive IoT. Now, if you look at 5G as a spectrum, it's actually made up of different tiers. So the first is the low band, and that in this diagram is at the bottom of the pyramid. And it's represented there because the low band is between uh, anything below one gigahertz. And that's excellent for distance coverage, and therefore ideally suited for massive support of IoT. The second batch of spectrum really is the darling bud at the moment of 5G, because it has all of the right attributes. It has high capacity, high speed, great coverage and penetration. And therefore, it's ideal for enhanced mobile broadband. And that is between 1 and 7 gigahertz. And there's a teeny tiny sliver of spectrum in the middle of the C-band called CBRS here in the US. And that's anything between 3.5 and 3.7. And it's so important at the moment, we're going to talk about it uh, in its own set of slides. So just shelf that for a moment. And then at the very top of the pyramid is the millimeter wave. And this is the ultra reliable, low latency, super high speed uh, frequency set over 24 gigahertz for this presentation. So if you put all of those uh, different spectrums together, they all fall under the umbrella of 5G. So let's talk a little bit about the attributes and why 5G is dramatically different from all of the other Gs that's come before it. Well, the first attribute I typically um, hear or about or talk about uh, when I'm talking to partners about 5G is latency. And why is that important? Well, with 5G, the latency is sub five milliseconds. That's a vast improvement over 4G, which is about 200 milliseconds. So by compare and contrast, a human on a good day has about 250 milliseconds of latency. That means by the time you issue a command and get a response back, the amount of time taken is the latency. And so why is this important? It's important because with sub five millisecond latency, you can usher in all kinds of new use cases that were heretofore just not possible because over the air speed just wasn't there. So if you think about machine to machine communication or the factory of the future, where you've got machines with hundreds of sensors, they all need to communicate and they need to make instant decisions. And the only way that's possible over the air is with 5G. With 4G, the speed just wasn't there. I'll give you another example. If you're driving down the road in a 4G enabled car and the car has issued a braking command, it would take about 1.5 meters. That's about an arm's width away before the car would break. With 5G, that distance is minimalized to about three centimeters. So clearly for these type of use cases, 5G was the, is the only way to support that kind of uh, new development and use case. The next attribute is really about the density and the capability of 5G to support a million devices in a square kilometer without any impediment of signal or, or degradation of signal. That's really important, especially in a smart city uh, system or a massive grid or from a consumer perspective, if you're at a soccer game or an American football game and it's the Super Bowl and you're all on your phones videoing a huge heroic moment and wanting to upload that to your social media, you don't want to get a spinning wheel. 
And therefore, from a consumer perspective, that density, that uh, quality of signal is, is guaranteed in the um, specification. Next up is the data rates at up to 20 gigabits a second over the air. So that's really enhanced mobile broadband, right? The ability to be free of wires. And if you're free of wires, just think about all of the use cases that that kind of mobility and flexibility will usher in. And 99.9% .9 availability. Now that's really important, especially for mission critical use cases. And the last attribute, which is sometimes overlooked, is the fact that 5G should reduce power consumption by 90%. So in a world where ESG has become so important, this is oftentimes an overlooked attribute of a 5G network. Less energy is a much greener solution. There's also another amazing attribute about 5G that you hear a lot about, and that's the ability to do a network slice. That's essentially to carve out a piece of spectrum, its own sort of super highway, if you will, that can be dedicated to a person, a service, or an application. And that gives an organization the ability to really define specific workloads for a specific swath of their own spectrum. And that's gonna be a game changer for all of us. Now, I mentioned on the first slide that there was a little bit of a band in the C band called CBRS. That's Citizen Band Radio Service. And this in the US is somewhat unlicensed spectrum. There is a license portion to it, but let's take a look at it. And the reason this is important is because CBRS is almost like Wi-Fi. In some areas, you don't have to pay for it. If it's available and you can use it and you can grab it, it's yours to use. Um, now, clearly there are some benefits to that in terms of cost, and there are some downsides in terms of contention. But the fact is the three GPP are deeming the CBRS 5G compliant. And so let's look at this little pyramid. On the bottom you see is generalized authorized access. And that's essentially like Wi-Fi. It's open spectrum, open for anybody. In fact, if you go to a website, you can log in and determine whether or not there's availability in your area and grab that specific spot spectrum. The next band up gives organizations a little bit more control. And that's priority access license. That is to say, you can actually apply for a license, which is good for about 10 years, right? So if you're a corporation or an organization, a campus or a university, and you want to use a 5G CBRS solution, but you don't want to deal with contention, you can actually license that band for your own use. And then at the top of the pyramid is incumbent use. And this is really the Navy, military, and satellite. And this is sort of where CBRS came from in the US. The government has it. But it's been auctioning off this spectrum to make it more available to organizations because there was ample of it. And so it's very interesting if you look at who was winning these bids. No surprises with the Verizons, the Dish, the Chargers, the Comcasts, and the Coxes of this world, right? The, the media companies. But what's more interesting, I think, from an enterprise or from a managed service provider perspective is that all of these private organizations, power companies, utility companies, media companies, uh, manufacturing facilities are out there bidding and winning uh, their bid for that PAL line, the priority access licensing. And that means those organizations now have their own dedicated band of spectrum in CBRS where they can build their own private 5G network. So now let's talk about the timeline and where we are. So I've mentioned earlier that we're at release 16 of uh, 5G. Release 17 is out is due out in the spring, should be out any day now um, in 2022. So if you look at this timeline right now, we're still in the initial 5G launches. That is to say some countries have blanket coverage of 5G, but others are still catching up. So if you look at what has been done to get us to this point, a lot of the telco providers are leveraging what's called non-standalone 5G um, networks. And that means that there's some portion of the network is still on 4G LTE, and then other aspects are on 5G. So that's non-standalone. But where the market's going and where arguably the most benefit is, and you'll see that in the architecture conversation, is standalone. That means it's not reliant on any parts of the 4G network. It's built from the ground up to be 5G, and there are lots of reasons that's brilliant. 
Open RAN is another uh, huge wave that's uh, upon us, and that gives organizations the ability to decouple the hardware and the software. So in the past, if you wanted to build a cellular network, you'd either go to Huawei, Ericsson, or Nokia and acquire their network equipment. Very proprietary, great equipment, no doubt about it, but at the same time, kind of a locked box. That is to say, if you wanted a feature or a function, well, you were at the mercy of their release cycle. With Open RAN, it's very much like virtualization, virtualization of the network. Now these network functions run on commodity off the shelf hardware. And that's changing the game because it's giving organizations the ability to put certain pieces of the network at different parts of their enterprise. So you'll hear a lot about the edge. That's network functions at the edge. And that's only capable because of this concept of Open RAN, Open Radio Access Network. And then um, many organizations now are choosing to employ private 5G. That is to say they either go to the carriers and get a certain band of spectrum from them and build their own infrastructure on premise or use some parts of the cloud to do that. Or similarly, they build a network around that CBRS band that we talked about. And we have some reference architectures that do that. And so that might be interesting to you specifically for your uh, customers that have those uncarpeted spaces, we'd say, where the early adopters are, that's manufacturing or logistics, anywhere that's outside of an office, so to speak. Uh, and those are really the early adopters of uh, private 5G. And even though we're talking about 5G and it's 2022, believe it or not, people are already talking about 6G. And the reason is this. 5G is a bit of a sea change. That is to say that from an architectural perspective, it's well and truly designed around software. So let's take a look at the architecture, right? First, you've got user equipment. That's the handset, it's IoT, it's Industry 4.0, it's machines. Then you've got the antenna, the E node Bs, the base stations, if you will. And those are managing spectrum, the quality of service, they're transmitting to and from the end user device and the core. They have specific antenna capabilities in 5G, very uh, modernized and new approaches to antenna uh, equipment in terms of being able to do beam forming, which is almost like a single line of sight to the end user device, and then multiple input, multiple output. Massive advancements in this technology, which make 5G more reliable. Back to that 99% uh, reliability availability. And then of course, there's the core. The core is really the brains of the network, but you'll see in a minute that in 5G, uh, it's very much a services-based architecture. So that is to say, all of the functions that make up the core network functionality are now objects, or uh, software objects. And therefore, those objects can be put out at different locations. I talked a little bit about distributing the network. So you can put edge functions out at the edge where they're best served. So the hardware disaggregation and software is really driving this uh, wave of uh, development and uh, ingenuity and really ushering in lots of creativity in the developer space. Because arguably now developers have this, the, the, the blueprints for what it's going to take to deploy a 5G network. And with companies like AWS offering private networks, uh, that's awesome because it turns over the keys of the kingdom, so to speak, to developers. And that's going to drive innovation. And then, of course, on the back end, there's the backhaul networks to the internet, which uh, makes uh, us all be able to take advantage of economies of scale of the cloud. And for cloud service providers today, you can expand your services out across the network to the end user devices. So I talked a little bit about 5G being very different from its predecessors. In 5G, we are dealing with a services-based architecture. That is to say, the network functions are delivered as software functions. So it's really that this 5G architecture really resembles a modern application that is built on services, functions, containers, and APIs. And these functions uh, communicate with each other via API over HTTP. And therefore, if you're a developer or you have a cloud practice with DevOps capabilities, this should be a very easy on-ramp for you to understand because these are just software functions that developers can understand and start writing perhaps applications that are able to leverage the functions in a specific way. So again, this democratization of the network now is going to usher in a huge wave of uh, innovation. 
So let's talk a little bit about the Edge. The Edge is incredibly important because it goes hand in glove with the capabilities of 5G. And the Edge is all about processing and analyzing and potentially monetizing data where it's created right out at the network edge. And because of the nature of 5G, you can actually run certain network functions at the edge where it makes sense. So the edge is all about connecting people, technology and data. And this is a huge opportunity based on the um, total addressable market. What the analysts are all saying is that organizations will increasingly want to move infrastructure uh, for that immediate AI and machine learning out at the edge and really capitalize on the benefits of 5G. And so what uh, moving uh, processing out to the edge enables is really real-time analytics. The, the ability to do ETL on your data, extract, transform, and load that data, and then make sense of it, and then give a response back in near real time, as opposed to doing multiple hops to analyzing with AI and machine learning in the cloud. There's still a place for that, but for that really high speed, low latency connectivity that 5G delivers, processing out at the edge is important. That goes to the five second millisecond latency. The really low latency enables a whole set of use cases because you get that instantaneous response that before just wasn't possible. And then there's the notion of the edge cloud. That's hyperscalers and network services, APIs and tools, with dedicated secure services closer to the user. So again, that penalty of multi-hop is alleviated or removed completely. And then of course, as we've talked about with the car example, with vehicle to vehicle communication, with edge processing, all of those issues with speed and transmission problems are alleviated and that ensures mission critical workloads. So this next slide talks a little bit about the opportunities that the industry has identified for 5G for managed service providers. And if you look at across the board, arguably, as I discussed earlier, the uncarpeted spaces are where we're seeing initial traction. And no surprise is that the biggest areas for uh, early adoption are really in um, industrial manufacturing resources, that's natural resources, and buildings and facilities. Over the course of time, however, as more and more adoption happens, more and more use cases will be made available for different organizations. So even in healthcare, for example, a healthcare organization could choose to employ a private 5G network. In fact, they could employ multiple private 5G networks, such that different departments or different staff may have their own network. So the sky's the limit. As soon as things become software driven, innovation starts to take hold. So then where's the opportunity in terms of adding 5G services to your organization? Well, if you look on the right side of this sort of pie chart, what it's indicating is that network management, no surprise, is growing exponentially. And that means organizations that choose to employ next generation wireless will look at integrating uh, private 5G or 5G from a carrier with Wi-Fi with their existing network. And that's a lot, it's complicated, and therefore partners with networking capabilities that can manage that integration, that can manage the network for their end customers are really gonna have a huge opportunity. Next, but no surprises, is really around network security. Needless to say, whenever there's an opportunity to add more endpoints, uh, there's more uh, area to have to insulate and protect. And therefore, organizations are really going to have to understand the security implications of adding all of these endpoints and this massive proliferation of devices to their network and ensuring security along the way. Now, 5G intrinsically has a lot of security features built in. However, much like everything, when you publish a standard for developers such that they can drive innovation, there's also bad guys out there with the same skill set that are looking for holes. And therefore, when you publish a standard, it's a double-edged sword. But from an opportunity perspective, there's massive opportunities in securing IoT and network devices for our partners. And then, of course, there's just holistic network management in terms of provisioning and commissioning and uh, orchestration, obviously. So across the board, the network is going to become the thing in IT. Really, it is the glue that joins cloud, core, and edge, and far edge. And therefore, 
being a manager of the network really puts you front and center and squarely at the heart of any customer operation. So let's talk about 5G as an enabler. It's clear to me not every partner is going to be out there building private 5G networks, and that's just fine. There are lots of partner organizations that do that, and you could partner with that partner to help them help you uh, build a network. However, if you look at all the tangential benefits that 5G is going to bring across the entire um, economy, there are a lot of opportunities in terms of network infrastructure. With 5G, almost hand in hand, in my opinion, is the ability to modernize the network as a whole. And so if you've got customers who are on legacy MPLS uh, connectivity, for example, you can go in and understand what's the driver for you looking at 5G. Most likely it's around network modernization and therefore it's a great opportunity for you to talk about SD-WAN or managed SD-WAN. RF ass assessments are a great opportunity to get in, do an assessment, understand where the issues may be, build a bill of materials, do the design, do the implementation, and then do the management. If you're doing the RF assessment, you have great insights as to what's driving that business, what the need is, who's making the decisions, and so forth. And then, of course, there's compute. Arguably, with 5G, you're going to want to take advantages of the massive advancements in compute, whether that's GPU or uh, new processors or slimmer, more dense, more powerful compute to replace legacy devices. And therefore, when you're talking about 5G and understanding what the use case is, knowing that AI and machine learning most likely factors into the equation, you'll want to have a compute that keeps up. And then, of course, as we talked about, security is a huge opportunity. Arguably, as organizations grow and as they want to modernize, there's going to be a plethora of older technologies in there that need to be consolidated. And it's a good opportunity to come in and look and do a proactive look at security versus reactive and get that organization thinking ahead of what's coming next for cybersecurity threats. And then, of course, there's a whole opportunity around devices, end user devices, whether it's a tablet or a smartphone that the organization is using or the compute devices or the IoT devices. They'll likely need device management, they'll need SIMs, they'll need activations and the like. And when we're talking about 5G, there's often an opportunity to look at the types of devices, the types of sensors, the types of gateways that the organization may need to employ to take advantage of the speed over the air. And that's usually a conversation that starts around IoT, the Internet of Things. And again, if this is new to you or you don't have a practice, Ingram has a methodology to help our partners stand up an IoT practice. And last but not least is cloud. Um, we kind of touched on it with the services-based architecture. You can now run services for 5G in the cloud. So if you're selling IaaS or platform as a service, there's an opportunity now to add 5G as a service to your catalog. And in so doing, look at all the other services that are required to really extract and monetize the value of uh, 5G. And that's things like machine learning, artificial intelligence. A lot of these services are available to you from the hyperscalers. And so if you put a wrapper around this from a partnering perspective, you've got the opportunity to go in and do the design, the planning, the building, the implementation. And then once it's implemented, you can do the monitoring and the management. And that will give you uh, the gift that keeps on giving with respect to monthly reoccurring revenues. So um, one of the areas that we're helping our partners understand the potential around 5G is proximity. So MEC, multi-access edge compute. And this is an example of one of our data center providers, which are managed in our business unit, whereby um, MEC, uh, the, the AI and machine learning is running out at their facilities, which are essentially at the edge, the network edge, and they're running some parts of 5G at the edge where it makes sense. And then over the access network, they're connecting to the end user devices. There's a certain amount of processing and core processing that's going on at the hyperscalers. And with the direct connections that these organizations can provide you and to your customers, they can take advantage of those uh, sort of lower latency connections back to the cloud. And that means all of their internet access and all of their cloud services can be delivered at speed um, through a, a MEC solution running at the edge. 
Now, we've talked about private 5G quite a fair bit. It's a lot in the news at the moment because there are a lot of the uh, vendors, the OEMs that we all know and love, have released essentially what we'd call a reference architecture configurations or design guides. So both Azure and AWS have solutions. The AWS solution is offered as a service, which is the way that organizations want to consume their technology. No surprises there. They're not breaking the cloud model, but essentially you'll get a private 5G um, radio access network uh, deployed out at your premise. And therefore elements will run in AWS and some elements will run on-prem. And all of this will be managed from the AWS console. And that includes um, helping the partner understand and manage SIMs and providing a single pane of glass um, to, to manage your radio access network. The Microsoft solution with Azure is very similar um, in terms of using Azure Stack. It's a complete package with a 5G core and Microsoft in fact have multiple relationships with different uh, radio um, uh, vendors and therefore you have a lot of flexibility and choice. And then, of course, there are solutions from the um, traditional network and infrastructure providers. Cisco, for example, have announced a complete package built on uh, their industry-wide recognized platform, the UCS, very powerful compute nodes, and they have a, their own converged core. So they've essentially streamlined the 5G core to essential elements. And that's cloud-based management. So that's really nice in terms that Cisco integrates very nicely, obviously, with enterprise network solutions and Wi-Fi, and it's managed holistically as simple as you'd manage Meraki, right? So very, very nice way to manage the entire network holistically. And both Cisco or the partner can manage the SIMs, which is really, really nice. And then, of course, if you look at Dell and HPE, both uh, leading providers of IT infrastructure and solutions, very well thought through solutions, complete on their portfolios, and also bundled up in their sort of as a service model, whether it's Dell with Apex or HPE with GreenLake. Now, the good news is all of these five solutions and others, in fact, are available to managed service providers at um, Ingram, right? So I would say contact your development manager and he or she can help you uh, navigate to the right team. I touched on this a little bit. It's a great way for those partners who are already offering Wi-Fi assessments to kind of broaden their aperture and start to include things like 5G. Because I'm often asked, which is it? Is it Wi-Fi or is it 5G? Where do I go? And the answer is go with both. Because arguably, if you're a large organization, you're already very comfortable with Wi-Fi. And there's thousands of devices that are supported on Wi-Fi. There may be some use cases, however, that Wi-Fi just can't keep up or give you the throughput or the low latency that you need. And therefore, a private 5G uh, infrastructure in that environment would make perfect sense. And therefore, being able to go in and do an assessment to isolate where 5G um, would, would serve the organization is a great way to get started. And that way, with certain tools like IB Wave and others, you can get a 3D map of the building and then do the placement of say small cells that are required like access points and then build the bill of materials and do the design build it implement it and then be off with uh, monitoring activities so i'm going to wrap up this session by talking about a specific use case just to give you a sense of how 5g may be used in one of the early adopter use cases which is in manufacturing so i've talked about uncarpeted spaces arguably in these larger uh, organizations, they have a lot of legacy equipment, what we'd call op operation technology, right? OT. And that OT is rapidly coming into the world of IT. Those worlds are combining because these OT devices are getting smarter, either by new purchases with more sensors uh, and capability, or similarly being retrofit and being brought into the realm of IT. And therefore, um, all of these devices are running 5G SIMs, which are reporting back their status, their health. You can do things like predictive maintenance and the like. Factories also are becoming more modular and becoming kind of the factory of the future is being able to reconfigure the factory on the fly. And the best way to do that is without wires. And 5G enables that kind of connectivity and speed. And then of course, there are tangential benefits to running 5G in the private setting. That is to say, there are certain devices that humans can actually wear, whether it's helmet, 
glasses are vests that have 5G SIMs that can monitor and censor certain things like a human. Is that person getting fatigued? Are they looking tired? Is their body language such that they may be uh, jaded and they may need to take a break? Or similarly, with uh, augmented reality and, and virtual reality, you can um, support remote workers or smart workers where you have somebody sitting in a command center giving instruction to a, a novice person on the floor over their glasses with low latency they can download manuals and the like so the sky is the limit but then we look at the use cases around 5g because i get it 5g is still aspirational for some but if you think about it when anybody's thinking about 5g if your partner or your customer is thinking about 5g you have the opportunity to go and do an IT assessment. Let's look at the existing compute that's on the floor. Will it support the 5G use case? Does it need to be upgraded? Clearly network design, not only from the 5G perspective, but also the Wi-Fi or the backend systems, the core network. And then obviously infrastructure upgrades across the board. Maybe you need some solid state drives or NVMe type devices in the compute as well. Security readiness is a big one, as we've talked about. More endpoints, more risk, more opportunity. And then obviously, if you're in the cloud game, which everybody is today, adding more cloud services never hurt. And in fact, more organizations are looking to deploy resources first in the cloud, and therefore you can look at some of the cloud services that you can broaden your portfolio of offerings. And then of course, there's application design. This is still a sort of a nascent area, where many partners ask, well, Carl, what kind of applications really need that speed? There's a lot of development happening. And therefore, if you're looking at some of the uh, workloads that are being targeted five, for 5G, maybe it's time to re-architect those, refactor them, or put them into containerized solutions such that they can be more portable and managed that way. So good opportunity there as well. And then, of course, there are always legacy equipment that needs to be replaced. So ITAD is a huge opportunity. IT asset dis disposition. And then of course, industrial IoT kind of goes hand in hand with manufacturing, assessing what's going on in the environment, being able to control devices, monitor devices, and do all important predictive maintenance to ensure that the components don't fail and you can take them out of circulation before they fail. And then of course, as I touched on AR and VR, that's augmented and virtual reality. That's an emerging field that's growing in leaps and bounds. And last but not least, activations. We have programs inside of Ingram where certain carriers in us, if you activate the SIM card on their network, you get compensated. So there's lots of opportunities that are wrapped around 5G. I hope you found this useful. If you've got any questions, reach out to your partner development manager and they'll put you in touch with the right people at Ingram that can help you embrace 5G today. Thank you.